Hey everyone, this is Christian Karasevich, and you are watching this week's episode of Social Chatter. And I'm just going to get everything set up real quick, but I'm about to bring our guests on. Um, we've got, uh, my name is Christian Karasevich. We've got um, Nick Rishwain. He's uh, my co-host. And then we also have um, our guest tonight, and his name is uh, Brian Fanzo. And so we're going to bring them on here one second. Um, for those of you watching, um, you can also check us out. We're in, here on uh, Huzza, but we're also going to be over on Facebook. So if you go to facebook.com slash social chefs, uh, you're going to be able to um, watch the broadcast there as well. So just give me one second. We're going to push this live and bring everyone on. And we've got a really good show for you tonight. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, Twitter Explorer. We're going to uh, talk about Instagram lead ads. Uh, a lot of big news from Snapchat. Uh, in particular, they had their IPO and they also had um, also a new snap code feature. And then um, we're going to wrap that up with some tools. So we got some good stuff. So hang tight. Snapchat, we've got some good stuff tonight, so this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, and by the way, Brian brings a lot of energy, and uh, Nick does as well, so let's do it. Okay, so we're also up on facebook.com slash social chefs, so let's, uh, let's bring our first uh, person in. We've got um, Nick Rishwain. So Nick, you should be getting an invite from me. Hopefully that went through. Awesome. Hello. How you doing, Nick? Good evening. How are you, Christian? Doing great. So, um, everybody, this is uh, my co-host. This is Nick Rishwain. Um, Nick, I don't know if you want to put your Twitter handle, you know, best sure. place to, be able to contact you and, uh, you know, kind of just tell people about yourself. Yeah, so I'm Nick Rishwain, and I am a vice president of a legal tech company uh, in California. And in addition to that, uh, I uh, founder and co-host of... Uh, Legal Tech Live, which is another live streaming show or what we'll call a live video podcast, similar to this one where we interview startup companies. And I've been doing this show with Christian for about three or four months now. Yes. So uh, so that's uh, Nick. And now let's bring Brian on. There he is. How you doing, Mr. Fanzo? Let me see if I can switch cameras real quick. Uh, okay. If not, I'll just have to look the other way. I'm imagining this is some of the w wire cast here. No, I'm, I, I'm, it should be for here. Let me bounce out real quick and then uh, just invite me right back real quick. Okay, so he's, he's um, switching cameras. Going to come back in in a second. But we've got a lot of good stuff to talk about tonight, don't we, Nick? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I, I sort of I was going over to check our Facebook feed, uh, make sure everything is going smooth over there. Yeah, we do have some good stuff tonight. In fact, there was a lot of news this week uh, in the social media realm. None of it was like you know major hard hitting stuff that like that we've had some we've had some really big announcements in the last few weeks and and this week had just a lot more minor announcements but interesting interesting stuff nonetheless uh some exciting things happening with snapchat uh facebook tv and and uh we got uh facebook some ad stuff for instagram and facebook you know some sort of simple stuff but uh, Facebook uh, is reportedly building a, a streaming TV app, and that's a, a, that. And in uh, in Snapchat are probably our, our bigger stories for tonight. Awesome. Hey, so, Brian, welcome. What's up, guys? All right, can you hear me okay now? 
Um, the mic's a little low, actually. All right, hold on one second. Let me switch mic. Sounds like you've got the computer mic. All right, are we back? Are we better now? Still a little quiet. Oh, we better now? Hold on. That's what happens when there's too many There's too many things plugged in at once. Hold on. <laughs> Uh, it looks like a lot of ideas in the background too, huh? Yes, <laughs> lots of ideas back there. There, let me. Um, she's trying to. Say, uh, what, what is it? She's using. It says she's using the Yeti, so it should be. Oh, why is it doing that? Um, I'll give you a little background on on Brian uh, from what I know, and I'm sure he'll share a lot more. <laughs> uh in just a second we lost uh I, I lost visual on youtube Brian, just there um but a little background on brian he's known as brian he's brian fanzo known as i social fans uh across social channels he is a former uh, believed department of defense uh employee who is now uh, a speaker full-time essentially speaker and uh talks a lot on social channels a lot on live video all right we'll see that is that my back better is that better that's better yeah. that's good all i right. was in i was introducing you brian i was doing a, a no, slow I like you keep going comp. keep going nick I, I liked it i i it's much much more easier to probably understand you talk explaining it than me <laughs> well that's because i talk a little bit slower than you do that's uh, just, just a, little a little bit, bit more relaxed uh, uh not that you're not relaxed but you do it a lot faster uh it, correct me where i'm wrong but uh, you're full time now in the speaking uh, essentially speaking uh touring doing that stuff uh and you talk a lot on customer experience customer interaction employee engagement and and what else tell me what else we yeah so i i mean i like to say i um i help translate the geek speak and help brands tell their digital story so i you know i do the speaking side i host two podcasts myself um and then also you know from a standpoint of i'm launching my first online course actually february 8th so coming up in uh, in, a, in about a week so i i like you know i've i've been very fortunate to be the beneficiary of the of the really the power of social media and digital community and and I like to help brands and uh, you know fellow entrepreneurs kind of do that same thing. Very cool, very cool. So that that sort of sums up, Brian. I think yeah, Christian sent you sent you a list of kind of our topics for tonight. There's there weren't a lot of huge huge social media reveals this week other than uh, i guess today it's a little off topic for for our audience but that snapchat filed for an ipo today um other than that we sort of uh taken something from last week and we'll jump right in christian unless you had something to add i was just going to jump right into our first story i know that's great actually okay Go ahead. so last week twitter uh it, it launched their Explore feature, uh, which is a new home for moments. They did this in the iOS app to begin with. It's not on the desktop yet, but we've launched Twitter Explore. Uh, and so it's replaced on my phone already. It's replaced the moments feature, which kind of allowed users to tell stories through a collection of tweets. Uh, it's no longer going to be the front and center, uh, the, the center button in the Twitter application. It's uh, actually the Explore button is now uh, in between the Home and Notifications button. So it's uh, second from the right. Uh, this is going to act as a way for people to find out what's happening on Twitter, including trends, moments, search, and featured live video streams. So I'm not sure how I feel about this change. I don't know that it's a it, it it's certainly not where Twitter is trying to uh, move the needle. I don't think it's one of those those types of features that's really going to move the needle. There may be uh, it may come with some ease of use because moments is, is uh, I actually am one of the people who uses moments. I view moments. I look at news, uh, the news feed uh, or basically what's going on in the world through moments uh and then i go to an article that's featured there and read about it but uh, i'm not sure that this explore thing i'm not sure how i feel about it i'm still getting used to playing with it brian what are your thoughts on twitter explore yeah you know, i think part of this you know i think twitter's making 
the move to being a real-time news aggregator, less of a social media channel. And part of it is simplicity. You know, and I think before you said, I need to search for something and you had four options. You could go, you know, the search icon, the moments icon, you could click and see trending topics. And then you could go search what live video was. And I think, you know, when you think about it from a mobile consumer that doesn't live and breathe Twitter, when you see you see the little you know the magnifying glass, you assume that that's going to open a window to search, and I think that's really what they're simplifying now in the OS. And I think it's a, I I, I actually am like you. I love moments. I, I I go to moments probably more than I ever thought I would when it was first rolled out. I actually wasn't sure how it would work. I created some early on, and then I still wasn't sold on it. But I feel like now it's somewhere where I default to go to, especially with um, you know a big sporting event or something going on. Um, it's very much like the Snapchat curated uh, discovery features. But I think it's smart. I think what they need to do is they keep it simple, stupid. I mean, let's face it, the, the people that they're trying to appeal to are the ones that are already confused by 140 characters and it's mm -hmm. already a different language. And they started making that movement when now we get to share links and pictures and videos and still get 140 characters, which is one of my probably my favorite moves they've made in a while. And I like this. I think it's, it, you know, it's like you said, it's not a huge move. I don't think it's going to, you know, the stock isn't going to go up by this, but this is all condensing the idea of simplifying the onboarding experience because the Super Bowl is coming up, right? And I think Super Bowl, we all know, like everyone kind of jumps on Twitter via a live event or a hashtag on TV. It's really the only way we all kind of figure it out. And then all of a sudden, it depends. Do we not show up again to the next Super Bowl? Or are we onboarded and, and figure out the power that is Twitter? And I think that's kind of where we're going at now. So I think it's a good move. I just don't think it's, like, I agree with you. It's not huge. But uh, the more it simplifies, the more I get excited for where Twitter is going. It, it, Twitter seems to have been, uh, it even took me a while to really learn it well and use it effectively. And now it's one of my favorite platforms, but it really takes uh, just like Snapchat. So maybe I just like things that are more complicated. I maybe <laughs> I'm that type of person, right? Uh, that I, I like both of those platforms over others because maybe because of that, but they're not the most intuitive uh, of platforms, the two of them. So if you're trying to move the needle in and in increase your monthly active users, maybe this is a step in the right direction. I'm not sure. Uh, I agree with you that the 140 character thing where you, you get to use all 140 characters, regardless of what else you're putting in there, that that is a big move. But I still think it is a mystery to a lot of users. Um, Christian, what are your thoughts on this move? I like the fact that they're combining things. I, for a while, you know, Twitter was actually not doing anything. They're kind of just like, you know, moving you know things along. Nobody was really talking about it, interested in it. The only thing they were talking about was, you know, just all the negativity around Twitter. And, um, you know, that sent the shares, the share price way down. Um, I think that by combining this, they're starting to, you know, move a little bit faster. Um, I think they need to move faster because a lot of the networks are, you know, Facebook, they're releasing what, one, two, three, four updates a week. You know, Snapchat is starting to release a whole bunch of things. Twitter, you know, if Twitter wants to still stay relevant, I mean, and they should be still relevant, um, they need to make this change quickly. So, yeah, I agree. There needs to be some fast changes, which they, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong. You've been on Twitter a lot, a lot longer than I have, or, or you've certainly, you, you said it changed your life. I've heard you say that before, but their ability to adapt and make changes has been really slow in the past, has it not? Without question. I mean, they are the worst marketing social platform that's ever existed. I mean, they had no CMO until a year ago. They couldn't figure out even how to tell their own story on their value. And I think that's partially because they kind of came on the scene and blew things away. They were the water cooler. You didn't have to invite friends of friends. You didn't have to know the people. You connected with people that shared a hashtag, a conversation, a similar phrase, um, and which was amazing. But I think it kind of got away from them. And then there was a, hey, do we compete with Facebook and Instagram? Are we a social network? Um, I, I believe with live video, with the video go live with the pieces they have, I believe the real time water cooler will always be needed. We need to connect. How do we grow and find people that don't know who we are? Don't trust us. Don't, don't know anything about us. How do we grow that right now on Facebook? Unless you're putting paid behind it and strategically targeting certain people, you're not growing that on Facebook. You know, Instagram is extremely hard. Snapchat's the hardest of them all. And so I still believe, I believe Twitter's, I, I mean, I have, I mean, I'm, 
in all honesty, I'm a Twitter fanboy without question. I mean, it's changed. Like I said, I changed my life and I have faith. I believe Jack is the right guy to lead it the right way. But in Christian, you're, I, I couldn't agree more. If they don't change at a faster pace, Jack's going to be out the door before he has a chance to really make the change. And I believe if that happens for the second time, you know, because he's, he's already been exited once, um, it could be a, a massive, massive end to Twitter because I think he's the right guy to push it towards this news real-time water cooler. I just don't know why, you know, they ended Vine, which was a smart move. They also ended some of those, you know, like Twitter dashboard app and a couple of the other things that you guys have talked about recently. These are all things so that the, the core of their team can focus on what's most important. The question is like, now it's start to put that things in motion. Cause if we don't start seeing that you're never going to keep the, you know, the stockholders happy and, and move the needle. And, I, and I'm glad to see it's not competing with Facebook or Instagram. They are trying to simplify in their own way because it's never really been a social network. It's more of been that open. I call it a, a global unfiltered fire hose of communities. And that's what I've always mm -hmm. referred to it. And, and it has, I get more leads uh, via Twitter and uh, more of my, you know, my business as a whole grows because of Twitter. But the crazy thing is if Twitter went away, I, I, I believe my, my business would find a avenue for that same kind of um, arena, which I think is probably scary for Twitter as a whole. Yeah. yeah. So, well, let me ask this question real quick for you, Brian. So what do you think as far as like, what does Twitter need to do to simplify things for people? Like, you know, they have a hard time understanding the 140 character side of things. They now have this whole explore tab. What, what is it like, is there, you know, do they need to have like instructions when somebody logs in that walks them like through like a wizard or something? Well, I think you know? there's two, so there's two places I think they've gone strategically wrong. And I, I mean, I wrote a blog post and had this whole video where I was petitioning to be CEO way back when. And for me, it's too, it's twofold. Like they've, they've done a bad job of creating they're turning their power users into their advocates at like live events. You know, when you go to the Super Bowl or South by Southwest, you don't see, Twitter, ha Twitter swag. You don't see Twitter teams running around. You don't see their, but all of us, but the hashtag is the biggest thing that we all use to, to filter and find out the conversation. And so I think they've kind of missed the mark on empowering their power users. And then I think the other piece is, let's face it, the, the onboarding of new users is what the, the, the market wants. But if you right. were able to take the casual user or the Super Bowl user, and keep them as a continual user, then your ad revenue goes up because now the people are logged in the, into the app more. Therefore, they're actually seeing more ads. So I actually like the idea of rather than onboarding process and, and really doing the, the new user, how about the user that sees the power, the lights go on at the Super Bowl, Let's let's worry about education from from the Super Bowl until March Madness. Let, let, let's focus, you know, and I will put it in a sports sense just because that works well for me. But like I think it's it's more so less than onboarding and teaching 140 characters. It's now saying, why should I follow somebody else? How do why should I follow a hashtag? The, you know, and, and so much has changed because it used to be, you know, you you don't need to follow a whole lot of people, keep your you know, and there's so many things that are different today that I love about this platform. But until you empower the the power users and you translate those casual users into into more frequent users, I don't think the onboarding of new users is going to move the needle at all. And I think that's where I think that's where I kind of disagree with their, some of their their strategy. But I can tell you they're putting a lot into events. I mean, I, I've I, I've done some work with their Twitter data team. I was at a couple of events in December and was blown away. I saw Twitter event people. I got to shake hands with people for the first time ever. And I was like, it's about time. Like we, we use our hashtags at every offline event, yet Twitter was never offline with us. And I think if we see that, I hope the Super Bowl, fingers crossed, we see that at the Super Bowl. But I think it's, it's those are my two, my, my two pet peeves. Power users, turn them into advocates. Casual users turn them into more frequent users. Ad revenue goes up. Stockholders are happy. And then we can worry about onboarding the users that understand Instagram and Snapchat. Because the weird thing is, the more you talk to teenagers, and I was at a dinner with um, Amy Schmidt-Tower. She launched her book this week. I was out mm -hmm. there in Columbus. And we were there with her two younger twin brothers who are 21 and their best friend. And they love Twitter. Absolute 21, 22. They love Twitter because Snapchat is where they have their conversations with their inner circle. Twitter is where they organize their big, their big community. And I think knowing that to me, that's like, Hey, Twitter, like let's pay attention here. Let, let's still move that needle. Um, but I, I love them, but I can't say that I'm always sold that they're going to keep doing the right thing. Cause I keep, right. 
I keep believing and I'm, I, I, I'm always let down, but I think I'll, I'll keep believing until my iSocial fans accounts turned off. And then I, I think I'll probably be really upset. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Should we move on to the next topic? You guys ready for topic two? This one's a little simpler. Uh, Christian, who's much, much more adept at these items than I am because he does runs more of these types of ads. It says, can this is from Facebook business and, can I run my lead ads on Instagram? And it says you can now run your leads, your leads ads across both Facebook and Instagram placements. It's recommended you use automatic placements when, when creating your lead ads. Automatic placements will be selected by default and will automatically select the recommended placements for your ad based on your objective and creative. To help ensure your lead ads appear on Instagram, make sure your creative follows Instagram's design requirements. Is this, is this, am I able now to run ads from just my Facebook ads account, my ads manager? Is that what we're getting at here? Yeah, so basically what we're getting at here is you could previously run Facebook lead ads. These were basically ads where somebody could, like it was two clicks, two taps, I think. You could basically capture somebody's information. Those are actually now coming to Instagram uh, via Facebook. So basically via Facebook ads manager. Um, and you know, and some of the benefits obviously to this, I mean, people are going to be able to on Instagram, you know, you're gonna be able to capture a lead at that point. Um, that's really what it's getting at. Um, there are, you know, a couple little differences with this. Uh, for example, you know, you have to be running the, um, Instagram mobile app. They're not going to work on desktop. Um, and I don't think they're going to show up on desktop. Um, I don't think so. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, and then they've got some little, you know, cosmetic changes like on Facebook, you know, you've got more room to scroll on Instagram. They're sticking with the, uh, you know, the square format. So you're going to have to actually page through some things. But really, it's the, the point of this is really the fact that um, you can now run Instagram lead ads, um, which you, where you previously couldn't. Okay. Brian, what are your thoughts on this? Is it just, uh, is it, is it a mechanical change? Is it? I mean, I, I, I think Instagram is the greatest platform that marketers haven't ruined, ruined yet. And I think mm -hmm. the, the app, the ability to capture that the Instagram user, you know, because I, I love the I, I think Instagram is such a powerful play because, you know, a majority of users are mobile. You know, a majority of users have a certain browsing habits. When you log into Instagram, you're used to scrolling and double tapping. Um, I, I like to say, you know, I, I run a podcast called FOMO Fans, which is a fear of missing out. And I discover a majority of my new mobile apps via Instagram. And it's one click. I click on the ad and it says download, in, you know, install. And I, I'm blown away how easy that makes it for me to discover new technology and new apps. And I think, you know, lead gen is a weird world where I think for a long time marketers, have, we've still kind of like we're building an email list, but we weren't sure, you know, of capturing a strategic ad. And I think doing these kind of things where we're, we're now able to take some of these one or two click type functionality that Facebook has really done really well and in, um, add them to Instagram. I love it. I just hope we we continue to make it to where we're not ruining Instagram by making it too click worthy or which is my always my pet peeve. If you know a majority of users are browsing via mobile, let's make sure that it's mobile links and it opens in mobile browser because that's like, I think the, the worst thing. And I think even Instagram stories, I got served up two Instagram story ads today for the first time ever. And I, um, I screen, of course, screen scrapped them and they were very mm -hmm. native, very much like Snapchat, which I was proud of. But I, 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 I always get worried whenever I see anything that says Instagram is taking a Facebook feature because I'm like, I, I hope they remember the Instagram user behaviors. But I, I like mm -hmm. it. I like it. We'll see how much. Um, editing it has to do. I spend a fairly good amount of money personally um, on Facebook ads and Instagram ads. And I think because of that also drives why so many people are using Instagram stories over Snapchat. Um, and so all of these things are more ways that Facebook is proving the value of Instagram to complement Facebook. And I've seen some of your ads, Brian, on both Facebook and Instagram recently. Uh, I actually seen it at the mobile experience. And the nice thing is, you know, I really have to hunt for it to find out that it's sponsored. Now, like Vincenzo Landino says, he's watching us over on the Facebook side, and he said he's a big, big Brian Fanzo fans boy, and uh, and uh, like him, I, I I I don't like the fanboy. It's it's never been my way, but I but I enjoy I enjoy your work, and I follow it closely and try and share and and. Uh, 
and so I'm going to like one of your sponsored pieces of content probably like I'm going to like another one, but the, partly is because we've met several times in person and, and I've been on several of these live videos with you, but they're very non-intrusive. So that's a nice aspect of those ads that you, you almost can't tell now, possibly because we're connected. I'm also not thinking that way when I see something come from Brian Fanzo, but it, they seem pretty non-intrusive. And, and I like that. That's on both Snapchat and Facebook. Well, let's face it. That's that's the future of advertising. We are so tired of having our experience disrupted by commercials. We added DVR. We got so mad that we even had to wait till a specific time determined by a TV network. We got Netflix and on-demand programming. And so I think Snapchat started this craze. I've been giving Snapchat a lot of credit because they require their ads to be created as a in a Snapchat formula, and it's very Snapchat native. And like you said, I, I love... You know, an ad should be able to present me value, not completely disrupt. And and I'm okay knowing it's an ad, like it's saying it's sponsored. If it's targeted, I mean, Amazon, I mean, they, they're in my Facebook feed every day. I don't ever complain because they're reminding me on things that I was shopping for or I forgot to buy. And I think that element of advertising is exciting. It's the, it's that it's that weird world where all of a sudden, like, if it's a full screen pop up in Instagram and, and like, where did that come? Like, I, and I think that's where all of these channels hopefully can go. And I'm not an ad expert. I mean, Vincenzo, uh, I was, I've been screenshotting a lot of Amy's ads and he ran a couple good, really good ads uh, in locally in Columbus while I was there. And I was amazed at even in inside of Facebook on the mobile phone, I was able to click it, open the video and as well as gave me the Amazon buying window below. So I could continue watching a promoted Facebook video while shopping on Amazon for the book. And those kind of things to me are exciting to see in the advertising space. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Should we move on to the next topic here? We, we're about 30 minutes in or? Actually, I got one last question real quick. Yeah, Brian. So, you sure. know, Twitter, um, Twitter, you know, Vincent asked this a minute ago, but Twitter had their, uh, their lead ads at some point. Um, they got rid of those. Um, unfortunately, you know, what, what are your thoughts? Cause I mean, we talked about this earlier. Um, they're not really taking a lot from Facebook or the other channels. Um, but they're also getting rid of features that the other channels are kind of pushing. Uh, that, we- I, that frustrated me probably more. And actually even the idea that I can't run a really good video ad. And I think mm-hmm. they did a such, I mean, a Twitter video, I mean, I'm getting 1800 views on one tweet of one video inside of Twitter, which, you know, and, and a lot of that ends up being more than a three or 10 second uh, view of a video that is less than two minutes and 20 seconds, which, you know, it's 140 or two minutes and, Two minutes and twenty seconds, or one hundred and forty seconds total. Um, I have no idea why that that went away. I I think part of it became you were able. Twitter is always given the smart marketer on Twitter the ability to kind of hack the system, where you could create Twitter cards without ever promoting them, and you could you could add a lot of these weird things in the advertising world. And, and I was guilty of using them because as soon as I realized that I could present some cards without putting money behind it, of course I started tweeting those out. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not sure why. Uh, and this is just one of those other head shakers, right? You know, lead generation is is important for every business. Email marketing is not going away. It's it's that number one place where a lot of businesses are finding true value, lead, taking someone from social. Why Twitter did that? Not sure. Why they're not allowing better video management? Not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I like to think that they're gonna they're gonna focus a little bit more on this when when you bring someone into a a video, allowing it to be a more immersive experience on the browser. But mm-hmm. still, why take away something? Now, while we're waiting for a new feature, then let us have it for a little bit more. It, it's beyond me. Good points. Excellent points. So next up is uh, what Snapchat rolled out this week with, uh, after their redesign last week and, and their discoverability issues last uh, redesign last week, they uh, are back with another update to the app, adding the ability to make custom snap codes for websites. Like, the original snap code that we all have, which is how people find us and follow us on Snapchat. Uh, This is an ad, uh, a user on Snapchat when viewed in the app, it's a, the snap code is an ad when viewed in the app, the new snap codes will prompt users to open a website when people snap the image. And uh, the verge calls it a subtle, but powerful move on Snapchat's part that will no doubt help further attract brands to use 
the network uh, or in other words get ready to see a whole lot more snap codes in your stories which i think is probably accurate i i think this is an interesting uh i think it's an interesting development for snapchat i think it's probably necessary because uh you know you you'll see people post hey i, I just did it hey we're going to be on huzza.io slash social chefs you can't click that link you can't save that link you can't do anything like that but i probably could i haven't tested out the uh the website uh snap code yet which i need to do but this is one way to do that and if i'm a trustworthy enough source people will probably snap it, it will snap it and uh, be taken to the site so brian what are your thoughts on this move um i don't know i think this is one that actually confused me you know i think snapchat usually does an amazing job of understanding their target user base. Um, but I don't know if their target user base gives a crap about sending someone to a website. Um, you know, and I think this is almost a weird play because they've made it clear that for brands, they want you paying ads and they want you buying geo filters. And for the users, they want to keep it real and raw and not give you, you know, even that new discovery search is still like, discovery 1999 like we're still like limited to like contacts and, and the way we're searching like i can't search technology and get everyone that's a technology snapchat or you know and of course like ghost codes type functionality um but i do see it as a sign that we're going to start to see kind of the ability you know and i think instagram let's give it face it, instagram stories the ability for a verified user which i am not but the verified user to, to say, hey, swipe up and it takes you to a, uh, automatically to a web page or at mention on Snapchat and you're able to click on that at mention. Those are two functionalities that I it's it's game changing on Instagram stories because it's allowing you to build someone's following or send someone to a website that's natively inside of the phone. So I don't I don't think it was a surprising one. I just I, I was hoping that the next feature after the discovery was an, another improved discovery or even the idea of collaborations, being able to, to contribute to a public group and invite people in. Like some of these things that I feel like they could do fairly easily. And I, I don't know, I was slightly disappointed. I, I saw the update. I read the, the news. And before I even tweeted out, I'm like, I'm going to test this. And actually Vincent Orlek, who's in here, I like messaged him about it. And I was like, I, I tested it and I was like, uh, that's kind of like a, a little buzzkill because I didn't think it was as exciting as you know uh, as before. I don't know. What did you think, Christian? Um, I actually haven't had a chance to test it out, but um, I I like the concept of it. But I also kind of look at it like this. Um, talking about like you know Snapchat spectacles, talking about, talking about snap codes, um, spectacles, for instance. You know, they came out and they kind of were the like you know Google Glass like 2.0, and I kind of see snap codes sort of being like the QR code 2.0. They are. So, um, which, we, we, which we know 1.0 like failed as miserable as Google Glass 1.0. So, yeah. I mean, it's, well, it's, and it's it's interesting because I think that um I think a lot of people like I'm not sure I kind of agree with you on the fact that like you know are these like relevant because um I think people are gonna you know people had a hard time like understanding QR codes for some reason like not understanding what the heck they did uh, you know and I think like Snapchat in a way has conditioned the audience a little bit by having you snap a code you know use a snap code. But we have we have Twitter codes now, right? I mean, we got the Twitter, and like, and even the Facebook Messenger has a code now. Yeah. And the only people I see that post that are people that I feel like are paid by Facebook or are part of the Facebook army. And it's the same thing as Twitter. Like, I mean, I think it's I think you're right. I think the snap code. I think the identification. I mean, I have it on a bag that mm -hmm. I carry around. So like, and, you know, I have and, and you see it on business cards. I love that identification. I'm just curious. I mean, I love the stories of Snapchat. Do we need the code? being presented in Snapchat stories or, or why not simplify it by allowing link out, you know, one link out per story. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I feel like we're complicating something that could be extremely simplified in an app that is already extremely complicated for a majority of the users that were not born on Snapchat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things, you know, I didn't test it out because I was like, how often am I really going to do it? Right. The, the only websites I really participate in, one has, uh, the one I work at, has a really easy to remember domain name. Uh, and then, and, and we do this, uh, and Social Chefs is pretty easy to remember. And and Huzza is not too complicated, but we, you know, probably a big story for tonight is that we're not going to have this uh, for, uh, or we're only going to have it for another month. Uh, but we, we chose to kind of avoid that for the night because we're just going to look for another home and keep on plugging away. Uh, 
I don't know how, how this will affect it. Uh, don't know, you know, if I have to now snap the code and then, ta- and then I have to be taken to the website afterwards. I can't go directly from the story that I'm watching at that moment. Is that how it works? Yes. It seems a little, it, it seems complicated to me. And it seems like one more step that I'm not going to want to take. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's part of that weird spot, right? I think right. if you understand that Snapchat user, I mean, when we they, they took away continual stories, which crushed my my views, which crushed even a lot of my engagement. I I thought it was gonna keep engagement the same and and, and bring that view number down, but for me, it it made things even more confusing on why they would do that. And then now adding a more code in there, that's now gonna take me to a browser. Um, but also, I think you actually, Nick, as you were saying that, you know, I have. 21 domains and I use a lot of those short URLs as redirectors because when I say like go to my podcast fomofans.live well it just is a redirect to a website not every user is thinking at that level so I can right. see I can see like you know I always have somebody's like I always say go back to the digital dinosaur and like getting my brothers on to Snapchat like does this make sense to them they're not going to buy a domain shortener maybe it does but um for me I I, I like you Nick was like when am I going to use this? Like mm-hmm. I couldn't figure it out. And I'm a pretty avid Snapchat user. I mean, I, once I figured it out, I like the story aspect. I don't, I'm not big on, Hey, go watch us on social chefs. That, uh, that whole kind of self promotion I'll snap out, but I'm not big. I'm, and I'm not going to overcomplicate it for my viewers either. Uh, or my, my audience, my community, I feel like I, it's, it's complex enough. And if they want to come find a friend of mine, Chris bear is in here and he, uh, in a former guest and, and he came to support the show and he came cause he knew you would be here tonight. And, and, uh, so, you know, if, if people are interested enough, I think it's, it's easy enough to find something that when you're looking for it outside and on a desktop that I don't need Snapchat telling me how to do it. Anyway, let's wrap up with our last story tonight, uh, and and then we'll get into some tools. Our last story tonight, probably the big story tonight, and one I think many of us have been expecting, is that Facebook is reportedly reportedly building a streaming TV app. Uh, This comes from Engadget. Uh, Sources say the social network is in talks to license original content for a new platform. Uh, Facebook hasn't been shy about video. We all know the report is short on specifics for the new app. Uh, but the wall street journal notes that it would prioritize video content rather than simply act as a big screen portal into your newsfeed. Facebook is also reportedly in talks with media companies to license, license a variety of long form TV style content ranging from scripted shows to sports and entertainment. Naturally, the app would be a platform to distribute this new content along TV st- alongside TV-style ads. Uh, and there's talk about probably a good fit would be testing this out on Apple TV at first. What are your thoughts, Brian? Love it. I love it. I absolutely love it. Anyone who's playing in the Facebook Live video space should love this idea. Um, I consume Periscope on my Apple TV. The Apple TV, the newest version, is... Light years better than the two versions I had before that. I've always been an Apple TV fan. I just couldn't figure out um, if I actually would, if, would the average user love it? I, I, I like wanted to love it. Um, I think now with the, you know, the new TV um, app that's in the Apple TV that allows you to search within one app, all of the apps. So you don't have to play like, you know, where's Waldo with your favorite TV show. When you add Facebook to that, imagine discovery for a Facebook live show. I mean, I've been screaming for a Facebook live discovery. Um, I mean, both of them, Periscope and Facebook have just done an atrocious job of allowing the average user to find things that they would be interested in, even if it was based on categories or tagging. Um, and I think this is a smart move. I think Facebook, you know, I watched the uh, inauguration. I had my laptop up, but I had Periscope on the, the on the T on the Apple TV. I had Facebook live on my um, laptop and multiple times, I, I, you know, I did the uh, airdrop to the TV and that is just another step that I think is disconnected. And I think when you put the app in Apple TV, then you get the search functionality. You get some of these things where, you know, I'm not going to search Facebook on uh, Apple TV. I mean, like, I think my Samsung TV actually has like the Facebook app on there. And I was like, that's weird, but you give me discovery of, of video content, which is what a TV was made for. Now you're talking. And I think that's where Facebook's going. So I love it. I think um, I'm actually surprised it's taken this long. I thought Super Bowl would, uh, I thought we would have had it two weeks ago and then we would be able to kind of play with it with, uh, you know, kind of the Facebook 
I think Facebook's going to be doing some things at the halftime show or maybe I shouldn't have said that because I don't know if that was part of the call that I had that I wasn't supposed to say, but if I didn't, <laughs> oh well. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I love it. I think it's great. Excellent. Christian, what are your thoughts? Love this idea. Um, I think that, you know, if we kind of go back to when like Facebook started testing live video and started, you know, implementing some of these features, um, they were very slow with rolling it out to everyone. They started with, you know, your, uh, you know, your public figures, that sort of stuff. Um, I think that they didn't come out with this ahead of time because, you know, they were really kind of trying to see, you know, let's get users starting to use this. Um, I agree with you, Brian. I definitely think that they need way better discovery on this. Um, adding, I know, a video tab on an app, perfect. But I think having this on like Apple TV um, and being able to like potentially go to an app and see what all is going on, I think that's going to be fantastic. Um, I do wonder, you know, they mentioned like set top boxes and, you know, this is the only downside to like tech these days is that a lot of these companies are really starting to compete against one another. They're kicking their own products off of like, for instance, Amazon's kicking off, you know, Google uh, Chromecast or sorry, Google Home. Uh, Apple TV, like you can't buy those on Amazon because they don't support the Amazon app. And so um, that's the only downside to, I guess, this is, you know, I love the idea. I just hope that it gets out there to everyone. So I, I, I hate that. I, and you know, you know, the hidden secret is Netflix is 100% mm -hmm. hosted on Amazon AWS. Mm -hmm. Therefore, their number one competitor, which is Amazon Prime, um, mm -hmm. if Amazon ever wanted to pull the plug, which, you know, let, let's just hope that th that world doesn't, you know, like Netflix and chill world would disappear. Everybody would be uh, lost <laughs> and, and, and confused and staring at a wall. But I, I, I think I think, unfortunately, I think we're like two years away from this this idea of, um, you know, competitive ball feel like take my ball and go home. Don't sell my land. You know, like, I think, I, I mean, I firmly believe collaboration is the future of innovation, not collaboration, like, you know, holding on to the things. And, and I think it's part of, it's been, you know, Steve jobs was the king of it. You know, he wanted every control, every variable, but I think even Steve jobs, if he was alive today would see the, the, the advantages of kind of opening this. I mean, net when the Apple TV updated with this TV app, we originally couldn't search Netflix and that lasted like a week. And if you search the, uh, the hashtag on, on Twitter, it was, I mean, the amount of people that were complaining to Netflix and all of a sudden Netflix search went back into the, uh, the TV app. And I think those are the things we're going to see people making these things that say, stop playing these games. You know, let, let's let, allow us to choose where and when we want it, but let's, let's allow collaboration to happen. Yeah. It's, it's really silly. I mean, it's, you know, to really kind of like wall off everything. I mean, to, you know, to force users like into, you know, picking sides basically because you pick sides and then what happens is you get stuck in the ecosystem and then everything is, you know, everything's moving along and you're like, well, hey, I want to go here, but hey, I can't. So users are going to, you know, they have a hard time making decisions. They're going to stick with the one that they've already bought into. Yep. Um, so. Excellent. And that wraps up our stories for the, our, our news items for the night. And we will turn to Christian for an introduction to uh, to our tools for the evening. And so I actually have uh, three tools here tonight for everybody. Um, the first one is called, uh, and by the way, Brian, if you haven't used any of these, let us, you know, feel free to jump in and let us know. Uh, the first one is called Liner. Uh, basically, it's uh, an iOS app. And um, it's pretty neat, actually. So basically what it's doing is um, if you're finding stuff around the web, you know, you can clip these things to Pocket, Evernote, like all that sort of stuff, right? But what you can do with this is you basically can make highlights of web pages, uh, articles, images, whatever. And you can organize them into uh, folders, basically. And then you can, you know, take that stuff and turn them into, you know, social posts, turn them into blog posts, um, you know, or at least implement them in those different channels. Um, fun little app, you know, it's like what a buck or sorry. I think it's free actually. Yeah. Sorry. Free. I, I downloaded the first version of it uh -huh. and it was kind of kludgy jumping between apps. Mm -hmm. Um, when I saw that you guys were talking about it again, I went down and downloaded it again mm -hmm. and I love it. I, I think they, they simplified allowing you to copy, you know, certain phrases and, and, and really, I mean, I do that with, you know, so many things and I, I usually, you know, pocket or flipboard it. Um, so I, I, I like it. I, it's a pretty, it's a, it was a cool tool when I downloaded it. I wasn't happy. And then now that you guys got it back, I, I'm going to definitely kick some more tires over the next uh, couple of weeks with it. Very nice. Excellent. Um, what so else have we got? Tool two for tonight. We have, um, this is just, you know, really something from HubSpot, actually. Um, HubSpot tends to release a lot of pretty neat little products every once in a while. Uh, this is, you know, for people that are having a hard time generating blog topics, uh, basically put in a couple of nouns. They'll spit back, I think it's about a week's worth of content. Um, and then, you know, you can 
basically, uh, you know, go through the suggestions and now you have, you know, blog topics for uh, your part of your business. Um, partly why I brought this one up, Brian, actually, is because uh, I think we were talking about Grammarly a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, while uh, their blog topic generator is going to give you ideas, um, you are going to want to run those through some tools and Grammarly. I actually, I've been using it. I really like it. Um, what, how, what's your experience been so far? I love it. I absolutely love it. It's. Uh, I wish it worked with Google Docs, but like we talked about just like two minutes ago, um, the fact that some of these tools don't play with, you know, Google drives me crazy sometimes. And, you know, I, I live in that Google ecosystem of Google Docs, Google Sheets, um, mm -hmm. but I've actually found myself creating my blog in Grammarly and then going out. But I like, I think anything that simplifies the, the type, you know, I was surprised I was reading through it, but then I thought, you know, I use BuzzSumo to understand like trending topics. And then I look at what everyone else is talking about and I figure out either a better way to say it or I get I, I could say something completely opposite so that it stands out. Um, so I, I think it's a good thing. I think you're right. I think HubSpot's always they always find a creative way to kind of uh, enable some of these things that you know some of us might stress over maybe longer than we should. So I Grammarly, I, I'm absolutely hooked on. Um, I, as I'm kind of known for being one that's not afraid to be uh, not perfect. And I think Grammarly has helped me even, even be okay with now with a little bit more correction. And it is funny when it wants me to give a comma on a tweet, I'm like, I already used my 140 characters. Sorry. <laughs> now, now that would actually be cool if they could have like a feature where, you know, I don't know how you'd, you'd implement this, but have like, you know, saying something like, Hey, I want to use this on Twitter, but um, you know, have it where it like, it knows that, Hey, I only have 140 characters to work with. That would be nice. That would be actually that would be really nice. That, that yeah, and I and even you know like Periscope titles, I actually write those in Twitter so that I know that I have enough you know uh, character space, and then I copy them in the in the pair. Well, I guess well I copy them in the Periscope because I use Periscope still, not the the Twitter go live, um, just out of habit. But yeah, you're right. I think that would be a nice feature. Now, Brian, uh, Chris Bear, who was a guest a few weeks back, uh, he said that having the Grammarly. Uh, he noticed a little slowing of his operation with his computer uh, by installing Grammarly. Have you had any of that same experience? I have not. And I can tell you, um, I have way too many plugins on my Chrome and, and Chrome does a pretty good job of slowing me down. But um, Grammarly didn't add any um, new uh, variants to me. But I also, you know, I am using the premium functionality now. So I, you know, I, 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 I posted the post out there on Facebook and um, I think, 67 people signed up so i have like 67 weeks of the premium um functionality thanks to uh, everyone who signed up for that so if you did i appreciate that um and i'm not sure if that has something to do with it but i, I haven't seen it um you know there's plenty of these browser plugins like to-do list even google docs uh, or google drive offline those slow my browser down but i haven't okay. seen it on grammarly excellent all right good. Yeah, i'm running that one as well nick and i'm not noticing a lot of slowness with it um no experience. okay awesome. good um by the way i think you know, that is a very interesting point, Brian. I actually wonder if maybe they sort of create that slowness um, artificially to encourage you <laughs> to buy the premium one. You know, I, the, I, I was thinking that as I was saying it, because I was kind of like, well, that's a very interesting uh, dilemma. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> he, of course, you said it might be his crappy computer. And and I'm using like a 2013 MacBook Pro. So I'm not I don't have anything fancy going on on this side either. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, it could be uh, could be their reason to get you encourage you to go up to premium. That wouldn't be a, a surprise. What do we have up next, Chris, Christian? The, the last uh, last tool we have for tonight, actually, and Brian, I think you actually use this. It's uh, it's Switcher Studio. Um, Big fan. You know, with the news, you know, for those of you watching, I mean, if you don't know, um, Huzzah basically got bought this week by um, Kickstarter, which actually makes a lot of sense. Um, when you think about it from a you know standpoint of Huzzah has the ability to sell products, uh, you also have the live component, you also have the community built in, um, Q and A and so forth. Like it basically, I think gives them another dimension to be able to make you know launching a product more exciting than just hey here's a video I filmed and let me put up a you know landing page. So um, we're actually looking for other tools you know to use, um, but Switcher Studio basically um, you know I don't know if you want to explain it, Brian. Sure. So, you know, it's more of a, um, you know, it's, it's mobile based. So you're either running it from an iPhone or an iPad. Um, I've run the, actually the iPad switcher studio pro version for since actually since before Facebook live came Facebook live. Um, it allows you to run multiple cameras that you can hook up on the same Wi-Fi. You can bring in videos and then their newest functionality is switcher go, which allows you to do it all from your phone. And you could, you can upload, let's say you have, you have a video that you want to play during your Facebook live 
before you had to go do that, like kind of a production style with Wirecast, a computer, all of these things. And Switcher Go kind of simplifies that in the mobile space. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a good friend with Nick, the CEO of the company. So I'm a little biased in the fact that I use it when I'm not in my studio. So when I'm in here, I use uh, I use Wirecast because it's just allows me um, to do a little bit more and, and take advantage of my web camera and a couple of things that I really wanted to, to leverage. But when I'm on the road, um, for even for the Super Bowl that I did – a week, a year ago, exactly this week, um, we were actually using Switcher Studio to to manage the different feeds as we were changing things. So it's not a huzzah replacement, but if you're looking and they do a great job, they have a the freemium version is really easy to download for iOS. You can use it directly from your uh, Switcher Go for your phone, and if you are paying, it's a subscription model, and I believe it's twenty nine ninety nine a month. And um, from a standpoint of you know. If you've seen my shows where I do like, you know, transitions between guests, mm -hmm. I'm doing all that via touch of an iPad while I'm on air because it's so simple. And I think that's um, a rare functionality. It's why we love Huzzah. It's why B.Live exists, this mm -hmm. simplicity of going live. And uh, yeah, Huzzah is a good one. Or uh, Switcher Studio, I'm definitely a big fan of Nick and that, those team over there. And don't be surprised if you see a couple more things coming out with them. Um, they're really tied into the VR community as well. So they're they're kind of bleeding edge on mobile production quality live video. Very cool. Yeah. By the way, we're going to have to um, definitely chat some more. I think about, you know, Switcher Studio, Switcher Go and uh, Wirecast, actually, because we're looking to potentially move to those. So happy yeah. to. Yeah, I, you know, and I made this comment on uh, Mike Stelzer posted a, a post uh, yesterday. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, you know, I lived in, I loved Blab and, and you know, mm -hmm. And I'm even wearing a Meerkat shirt. So like, yeah, I mean, I let, 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 let's say, let's say that I, you know, I, um, I, I believe, you know, for these platforms, you know, kudos to the Huzzah team. Um, mm -hmm. Kickstarter had a very um, fun lives component that was very kludgy. Um, mm -hmm. As soon as they, they, they had it, they sent me kind of, uh, you know, premium access. I was very disappointed in it. And so hearing that they bought Huzzah and they're going to, you know, bring in these functionality, genius, smart move. Um, but I, you know, I think part of this, problem ends up being Facebook and Periscope aren't giving us all the functionality we need. So we want to be able to, to bring in some of this other functionality. I've just, I've taken the role. I do all of my shows using Zoom or Skype. Mm -hmm. And then I use Wirecast to connect that into Facebook Live and Periscope, uh, mainly because I was so burnt by Blab. You know, I, I, I did two <laughs> shows a week since the day Blab started. I ran 22 hours during the Super Bowl for, for uh, at Blab and um, I didn't want to get kind of tied in, but I think, you know, Huzzah did it the right way as well. You know, like giving enough time for people to, to change, you know, there's lots of options from be live to crowdcast to blue jeans. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, you know, I think social media examiner is going to crowdcast. Um, I know, I think uh, Mitch Jackson, a friend of ours is going to, um, I think he's going to blue jeans. So, you know, I think there's, there's lots of options. I prefer now to, um, kind of control more of my uh, my production on my own. And I don't see Facebook Live or Periscope doing uh, more than one broadcaster anytime soon. I think both of them have really struggled at not making it FaceTime. And, um, you know, until that functionality ever gets rolled out, we're going to have to figure out another solution. But um, I don't think Huzzah doing what Huzzah is doing is the same as Blab. It's just, it does require shows like yours and, and social media examiners to really, um, you know, find a new home, but you guys have great audiences that will, you know, find you wherever you go. Definitely. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and uh, I would say, I mean, as far as the, you know, as far as the tools go, I mean, um, it is unfortunate that, you know, Blab for instance came out and they kind of shut down and then, Hey, Huzzah came out and it was essentially Blab 2.0. You know, it was pretty awesome. And then, you know, it kind of makes you question, like wonder, well, you know, why did, why did they not sell like at that point, you know, were they kind of ahead of the curve, um, you know, as far as like the whole like industry, you know, I'm, I'm glad they sold, but you know, it doesn't I think it's, a, it, I think it's a hard, it's a hard monetization game. I think right now, you know, we, it, brands, brands and advertisers can't figure out live video, right? We, we're, you know, I'm working with a lot of, I'd say production quality live video. I'm a, um, I'm a partner in Del Mundo. We do social video analytics. Um, and the biggest problem is really what content works? How long does it work? I mean, I think some of the other news was like, you know, Facebook really giving people credit for longer videos that sustain viewership over a long amount of time. That's great. But like, that's not what they've taught us for the last three years. Like, you know, like we we're, we're kind of, at the mercy of Facebook and Periscope. And when we, the users are at the mercy of them, these tools like this are even more at the mercy. And I, and I've never been, um, you know, 
Meerkat burnt me. I, I was Meerkat loyal. Uh, Blab, I wouldn't say they burnt me because I, I think we kind of saw that writing kind of happening. But um, I, I, I'm not one that ever get mad at a band for going big and calling them a sellout, which is, you know, I think kind of right. what Huzzah's doing here. But, um, you know, kudos to them. Good for them. And I, and, I, and I hope that, you know, all the communities that are on there find their home. Because I do feel, I feel a, a, a missed opportunity without blab still because of blabs discovery that existed um there'll be there'll be times where i'm like actually I, I ran into somebody this past weekend and i was like oh my goodness like i haven't talked to you in forever and they're like yeah we used to talk like you know probably once every other week just because we'd pop in on a blab right and like that just that that like that ability to to pop in on video as a community was just so amazing i i, I still yeah I, I guess as you can tell i, I still miss um blab for that reason but you know, everyone's moving on. They're they're doing really um, good things with what they're doing as well, and I think Huzzah will do great things with uh, the Kickstarter team. Yeah, awesome. I agree. I think that's a, a great way to wrap the evening. Brian, thanks so much for. Uh, it, it, I ha I have to say that I hear Brian in Snapchat, where I where I see most of your stuff these days. I hear him say he oftentimes has trouble saying no, so I gave him an out. When I invited him, I said, look, if you're too busy, say no. I'm not going to take offense to it because I know how hard it is to say no when when I know that difficulty. So I appreciate you coming tonight. I really do. Uh, will you be at are you going to be at Summit Live this month or? No, I won't be. At, I won't be at Summit Live, but I'll be at Social Media Marketing World. So okay. I won't be at, uh, at Summit Live. But yeah, I appreciate you know, I tell you what, um, you know, in the community, especially live video community, people that are giving and always, you know, uh, building the community up. I will never say no to you'd both do a great job of that. I consider both of you guys friends. So, um, you know, for me, I think saying, saying, saying yes to you guys is, is even in the, it's, it's an easy one because I I'm proud to be a part of this community that we are all kind of learning together and, and trying to build each other up. So, uh, it was my pleasure. It was a it was a late night one. It, it does kind of feel like a blab because this used to be kind of my my hours of blab. So uh, it was my pleasure. And you know, if you guys get a chance, check out um, beyourself.live. And it's my new course. It'll launch um, February eighth. But it's my first online course, kind of walking people through my journey in personal branding and building my story and how I leverage digital to tell my story and kind of connect with influencers brands and kind of build the business that i have and uh that's what you see behind me on all these walls i'm turning all of this brainstorming into uh some uh, about four and a half hours worth of uh online training and do you have any other projects that you need to that you'd like to share with the audience tonight any other uh, i know you've podcast, always you know, got something going on yeah the podcast you know fomo fans right now is i'm blown away it's been I mean, I had, I had, I'm very hot, hard on myself and I had expectations um, to get to certain download numbers uh, at the six month mark. And uh, I didn't hit 60 days and I hit those numbers and it's just been amazing. The community has been amazing. Uh, I locked in two sponsors. I hopefully will have a third sponsor to that show, but I'm doing it, you know, once or twice a week, but I do a live com video component. So every Monday, 4 PM Eastern time, I go live on my Facebook page. So just facebook.com slash iSocial fans. And I, I, I broadcast live all but five minutes of the podcast so if you want five the last five minutes of the podcast you have to go download the audio version but um yeah i try to in it's been so much fun i, I really do enjoy um that podcast so yeah those are my two big projects at the moment is uh launching the course uh next week and then uh this podcast i've had episode 15 which was just went live uh yesterday with amy schmidt tower so uh yeah i'd love everybody to check out that podcast excellent very good and thank awesome. you so much for being here what Thanks so much for being here, Christian. Thanks again for another great show. And uh, Brian, hope you'll come back and, and visit us again in the future. I will. All right. Cheers, Thanks, guys. guys. Have a good night. Thank you.